22-year-old Belinda Murphy awoke from a deep sleep, groggy, foggy, and unsure of where she was. Someone was yelling at her, but she was still pissed from heavy drinking the night before. Or was it the same night? What was the time anyway? Who was yelling at her? The last thing she remembered was being outside Ryan's Hotel in Turalgan, fighting with some stupid cows who just wanted to start shit. During one of a whole bunch of fights, she'd seen her sister Katie kick some girl in the head while she was on the ground. She remembered ringing her boyfriend Greg and him saying that her one-year-old son, Jaden, had burned his bum on the radiator. But her sister had called him back later. She said it was fine. It was one of Greg's jokes. So back to the current moment, and it was Greg who was shaking her awake. What the fuck, Greg? She was just trying to sleep it off. I was lying to you, Belinda. Jaden's not in hospital. He's missing. We've got to go to the cops. What happened next took the entire country by storm, raising mysteries upon mysteries, furthering a class divide, and creating a buffet for the forever famished Australian tabloid media. Let's take a stab at this. Hi mates, and welcome to Something About Murder. I'm Jay Something, and every week I bring you a couple of cases from Australia's true crime history. If this sounds interesting to you, please help us out by shooting the like button with your trusty boomstick, stabbing the subscribe button until it bleeds, and then punching the notification bell in the face to be notified every time we release a new video. All of our episodes are released at the same time in podcast form on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your true crime podcast fix. Jaden Lesky's disappearance in 1997 became gripping tabloid fodder for the Australian media for ages. Whether it was the colourful and nefarious characters of the story, or the rundown town of Mowie where they all came from, the media were whipped into a frenzy, and Australian readers couldn't get enough of it. But at the centre of it was a 13-month-old little boy called Jaden, with a cheeky smile and bubbly little personality, and the questions about his disappearance and death that haunt those involved to this very day. Belinda Robin Murphy was born on the 22nd of September 1975 in Bensdale, Victoria, the daughter of a teenager called Pam and a timber mill worker. Her mum always wanted a boy who she could call Billy, but when Belinda came along, she added that to her name, resulting in the unusual spelling of Belinda. B-I-L-Y-N-D-A. Belinda. She had a sister, Katie, who was three years older than Belinda. They grew incredibly close throughout their childhood and teenage years. It wasn't until their early adulthood that the two sisters began to be at odds with one another. In the early 90s, Katie, the older sister, became pregnant with her first child. During that pregnancy, she met a young man named Brett Lesky. She adored Brett. In October 1992, right after she had given birth to her daughter Harley, Katie and Brett got married. Shortly thereafter, Katie fell pregnant again, this time with Brett's child. That child was born in 1993. Shortly after that, Katie and Brett separated and filed for divorce. Katie suspected Brett of cheating on her, with Belinda. Seems outrageous to all, until a short time later, when Brett and 17-year-old Belinda officially start dating. Despite the early drama of their relationship, Brett and Belinda lived together quite happily for the next couple of years. They were quickly engaged and had their first child in January 1995, a daughter named Brianna. Their second child, a son named Jaden Raymond Lesky, was born a little over a year later, on April 30th, 1996. Unfortunately, the relationship between Jaden's parents, Brett and Belinda, would begin to deteriorate over the next year or so. Brett had previously taken half of a friend's shed for performing mechanic work. And unfortunately for Brett, his friend, Greg Damasovich, struck up an affair with Belinda shortly after Jaden's birth, around September 1996. They managed to keep this low key for some time, but in April 1997, news of their relationship would reach Brett's ears, who decided to break off his engagement to Belinda and moved to Western Australia, leaving behind the three children he'd fathered with the two Murphy sisters. Greg Demasevich was born in Moi on the 26th of September 1968, the only son of first-generation Russian immigrant parents. 
He attended high school in Newbra, but officially dropped out in 1986, although he'd hardly attended school in a couple of years. He was known as a bit of a loser around town and a weirdo. He was obsessed with aliens and would put Big M milk containers on his roof for the aliens to drink and therefore not take him. Belinda, who was still in her early 20s, was now left alone with her two children, Brianna and Jaden. She decided to continue seeing Greg, who she called Grishka, but remained unaware that he had the secret of his own. In addition to dating Belinda, he was also sleeping with his ex-girlfriend, Yvonne Penfold, who had become part of the later problems. For the most part, Greg and Belinda seemed to have a good relationship. Despite them having come together in what amounts to infidelity, they seemed to make each other happy. Greg was unemployed at the time, but found the odd job here and there, and filled his days with car repair for friends and others. He lived in his own house on the other side of town, where he lived with his three dogs. Looking back though, it's easy to see that there were flaws in Greg, and their relationship, that Belinda might have overlooked. In particular, Greg seemed to show some concerning signs of attachment to Jaden, Belinda's young son. He often told Belinda that he didn't like the babysitter that she had hired to watch over the kids, and constantly offered to watch over Jaden in the sitter's absence. He never really expressed the same concern or interest in two-year-old Brianna, nor their cousins, Katie's kids, Harley and Shannon. Greg's particular interest in Jaden continued into the Australian winter, and he repeated his offers to babysit for Belinda whenever she needed it. In June 1997, just days before Belinda finally agreed to let him watch over Jaden for a few hours, Greg had given the one-year-old an unusual-looking haircut that resembled his own receding hairline. He had also cut small triangles into the back of Jaden's hair. Belinda confronted him about the haircut, and Greg jokingly told her that he simply wanted Jaden to look more like him. You see, with Greg, you never knew when he was being serious or if he was just taking the piss. He had a weird sense of humour that expressed itself in the weirdest moments. Moments like Jaden's haircut, or the times that he joked about he and his dogs having been abducted by aliens. You weren't ever quite sure when he was having a giggle or not. There were also times when Greg would tell Jaden to shut up, or lock him in rooms or hallways. Greg couldn't bear Jaden's crying. He'd take it out on him. Friends saw him push Jaden over a few times onto his back like an inflatable toy. Jaden would bounce on his nappy and topple onto his back, and sometimes his head would hit the floor. One day, Greg took Jaden on a fishing trip to Blue Rock Dam, and apparently Jaden was dropped by Greg as he was lifting him over a fence. There was some blood under his eye, and Greg comforted him following the incident. Belinda later said that when Greg brought Jaden back after the trip, she saw scratches and bruises on his face, and Greg told her it must have happened when Jaden was playing with the dogs or playing with sticks. In May 1997, Jaden stayed overnight with Greg and the child returned home with a bruise mark on his face which looked like an adult's hand. Belinda said that Greg had told her he'd hit Jaden's head on the car door and after that he would not stop crying. He also told her that he'd taken Jaden inside and tried to stop him crying but then he lost it. Greg offered to go to the police or welfare and tell them what had happened as he was afraid they might take Jaden away from Belinda. Neither the police nor welfare was informed. However, after this occurrence, it appears that Belinda was more nervous around leaving Jaden with Greg. But this leads us to the 14th of June, 1997. Belinda said that Greg came to her house late in the morning and requested to have Jaden for the day, to which she agreed. He was to pick up Jaden after going to place his tats lotto numbers on. Belinda then dressed Jaden in warm clothes, as Greg had said he was going to work on his car and it might rain. Jaden was dressed in grey tracksuit pants with a green trim on the bottom and the words baby games on them, a green long sleeve shirt, a blue grey windsheeter and a red jacket. She also pinned a new white dummy to Jaden's clothes and put four nappies in a blue plastic shopping bag along with some more clothes, a bottle, an apple, a muesli bar and a lollipop. Belinda stated that she'd given Jaden toast for breakfast but he'd not have anything else to eat before leaving with Greg. She noted that it would be unusual for her son to go right through the day without eating more than his breakfast, as he had a really good appetite, and he would cry when he was hungry. Greg returned to the house in about half an hour, and they both put Belinda's car baby seat into Greg's car. Evidently, the baby seat was wet, as it had been on the veranda. Greg then drove for four of them to Katie's house. Greg dropped Belinda and Brianna off there at around 2pm. Belinda had not asked Greg to keep Jaden overnight and was under the expectation that he would drop Jaden back in the afternoon. 
It was planned that a babysitter was going to look after all of the children at Katie's house that evening. Greg drove away with Jaden Lesky in the back seat of his car as 22-year-old Belinda prepared to enjoy her first night out in months. But before they left, Greg handed Belinda an extra $70 in cash and told her to have a good time. Belinda gave Jaden a kiss and then Greg drove off. And that was the last time Belinda ever saw her little boy. After saying goodbye to Greg and Jaden, Belinda began to set her sights on the evening's festivities. That night, she and her sister were planning to head to a friend's birthday party in Traralgon, a small town about 30 kilometres east of Moe, and were planning on leaving their children in the care of a babysitter for a few hours. Obviously, Jaden was with Greg, so that would ease the burden on the sitter, who'd watch after the other three kids until the sisters returned home that night. Since they weren't planning to go out for a bit, Belinda and Katie peacefully hung out at the latter's home for the next couple of hours, along with their daughters. Meanwhile, Greg and Jaden arrived home to Greg's house, and after this, apart from Greg, there's no evidence that anyone else saw Jaden alive. No one else saw Jaden at Greg's house that day, or in the evening, although it was possible that Jaden's voice was heard during evening telephone calls between Belinda and Greg. According to Greg, he was going to be working on his car that afternoon. He opened the gates and drove his car into the backyard with his three dogs. On arrival at his house, Greg got Jaden out of the car and reversed the car up the ramps and jacked up the front of the vehicle. The jack was a trolley jack that his friends Glenn Walker and Brett Edwards had dropped off at his place earlier in the day. He then closed the side gates and the backyard was enclosed. Greg stated that he worked on the car during the afternoon. Apparently he was welding the exhaust to stop the tailpipe from hitting against the bumper bar. He was fixing the heater cable as well and spraying some of the front of the car. Apparently the car fell on him a couple of times. At some point, Greg was interrupted by his telephone ringing inside. He ran in and grabbed the phone to hear the voice of his friend Darren Farr, who surprisingly sounded upset. Darren told Greg that he'd heard rumours about Greg wanting to kill him. The conversation between the two meandered over the next hour or so, with the two people arguing about who had said what and when. At around 3pm, Greg finally managed to get off the phone, and after this call, he continued to work on his car until Jaden fell down and needed to be cleaned up. Greg took Jaden inside and cleaned him up and got him a snack, some chips. At this point, he noticed that Jaden cut his lip, and he decided to give Belinda a call to check in. Belinda and her sister were still hanging out with the kids when she got the phone call from Greg. He told her about Darren Farr, which surprised Belinda, who assumed that the two were still good friends, and then followed that up by saying that Jaden was doing well. Greg described the fall that Jaden had taken outside and the cut lip, but promised that they were doing fine and he was going to give the boy a bath before bringing him home. Belinda was assured that Jaden was just fine because as she spoke to Greg on the phone, she could hear Jaden in the background playing with the dogs. He'd just learned to walk and could only say a few words at this point, such as mum and dad, but dog was among them. It was dark when Greg finished working on the car. The light to the porch was on at the back and there were no lights in the garage. He positioned his car in front of the gates when he'd finished working on it and then went inside at around 6pm. Apart from some chips, Greg also said that Jaden had not eaten during the afternoon. Apparently he had his bottle, which had cordial or coke in it. Following the telephone conversation with Greg, Belinda had an argument with her sister and walked home in the rain with Brianna. After arriving home, Belinda rang Greg to tell him to bring Jaden to her house rather than to her sister's place. She said that she tried to ring Greg about 15, 20 times with no answer. The calls were spread out and she used the redial button, so she knew she wasn't getting the number wrong. She just wanted to find out where Jaden was. Greg later said there was no reason why he wouldn't have answered the phone. A friend of Greg's had planned to drop by at around 7.30 that evening to pick up some Nintendo controllers, but continued driving when they saw that Greg's vehicle wasn't home. Belinda and Katie made up over the phone, and Belinda decided to go with her and Katie's boyfriend Neville to the party in Traralgon. The three of them left Moe for Traralgon at approximately 8pm. Belinda said she'd been concerned to find out where Greg and Jaden were, and she wanted to stop at his house because she was a little bit worried but Katie wouldn't let them drive that way because they were driving in Neville's car, which was unregistered, and so they continued on to the party in Traralgon. When Belinda arrived at the party a short time later, she continued trying to call Greg, but these calls continued to ring or go to answering machine. It had now been hours since she last saw or heard from Greg, and she had no idea where he or her son were. Ms McKinnon was one of Greg's neighbours, 
Their houses were separated by a vacant block. She arrived home at about 8pm. During the night, she rang Greg on a couple of occasions to see if he had money for her from one of his friends who owed her money. He didn't answer the phone, but apparently this was not unusual. She said that Greg phoned her back at about 10pm and he told her he'd phoned a couple of times earlier. They talked on the phone for about half an hour and he asked whether she had any nappies as he'd run out. She advised him to use a towel instead of a nappy and her husband from the background said he could come and demonstrate. Greg told her that uh, he knew how to do that and she also told him that he could get nappies across the road at the service station. Greg asked what size Jaden would be and asked whether all service stations sold nappies. During this conversation, Miss McKinnon offered to lend some clothes for Jaden. However, Greg said that he had plenty of clothes. She also heard Jaden in the background and the child was laughing. Greg also told Miss McKinnon that if Belinda got back early, he would come over to her place. After moving on to Ryan's hotel in Turalgan for more drinks at around 11pm, Belinda called Greg's home phone yet again from a payphone. This time, she finally got through. During this phone call though, it became evident that everything was not alright. Greg told Belinda that shit's happened, and that Jaden had burned his bottom by standing too close to a heater in Greg's house. Because of that, he'd taken Jaden to a nearby hospital to receive treatment for the burn, and they'd applied some kind of cream to the burn mark. This, however, wasn't enough of a treatment for Greg, so he says that he'd taken Jaden to another nearby hospital afterwards to get a second opinion. That's where Jaden was as the two were talking over the phone, allegedly, at the second hospital, being overseen by staff. Belinda started to panic. She was having a good time at the pub, but she told Katie that she needed to leave and figure out what was going on with Jaden. However, Katie told her that Greg was most likely making one of his jokes, and a follow-up phone call with Greg confirmed that he was joking, or exaggerating maybe. He told Katie that Jaden did not have a small red mark on his bottom, but was doing fine. Belinda, drunk and partying, accepted that and continued raging. Over the next hour or so, as far as we know, things were quiet around Greg's home. As far as anyone knows, he was still watching over Jaden at this point and had been home for at least a couple of hours following his mysterious multi-hour absence in the late afternoon and early evening. At some point between midnight and 1am, Ms McKinnon heard what sounded like Greg's car starting up. She recognised it because it had a very distinct starting sound and she remembered it happening between midnight and 1am, not at around 2am, which was when Greg got a call from Belinda to pick her up at Ryan's hotel. When he left, Jaden was asleep on the couch, the heater and television were still on, and there was no one else in the house. The dogs were outside. Greg arrived at the pub to pick up Belinda sometime between 2 and 3am, and she was clearly inebriated. When she got into the car, she was surprised to see that Jaden was not in the car with Greg. The back seat was empty, and Jaden was nowhere to be found. Almost immediately, Belinda asked Greg where Jaden was, and he told her that Jaden was currently at Maryvale Hospital and was being overseen by nurses and doctors due to the burn on his bottom. There's one problem with that story, however. Maryvale Hospital was still being built and wasn't taking patients at that time. Anyway, Belinda demanded to be driven to the hospital immediately, but Greg refused. He told Belinda that showing up pissed would not look good for her as a mother, and he said he'd drop Belinda at home and then return for Jaden. Greg had an open bottle of Jack Daniels whiskey in the car, and Belinda drank it as they drove home. Over the next several minutes, Belinda continued to pepper Greg with drunk questions, which he didn't answer. As they returned home to Greg's house, they noticed that the front windows of Greg's house were smashed, with glass in the living room. Greg then looked around everywhere, including in the cupboards, but he didn't say anything about Jaden. Belinda told Greg to ring the police, and he responded by saying that he didn't dob people into the cops. Greg immediately rang Yvonne Penfold. Remember her? His ex-girlfriend that he was still fucking? Greg yells at her, Is this one of your sick games? And angrily hung up. They didn't stay long at Greg's house. It was 3.04am uh, on the video when they left the house, and Belinda saw a pig's severed head on the ground as they were leaving. Greg then drove Belinda to her house, making sure to slowly drive past Yvonne's on the way. Belinda asked him to stay and gave him a key to her house. Belinda then phoned a friend she had seen in Turalgan that night to make sure that he got home safe, and the babysitter who was looking after Brianna at Katie's house. She then phoned Greg and asked him to return to her place with Jaden, and he said he would. Belinda then fell asleep in the lounge room in front of the heater. Greg was later pulled over by a police officer for speeding. 
The officer gave Greg a breathalyzer test to make sure that he wasn't under the influence, and Greg was let go without incident. He never once mentioned his vandalised home or, or Jaden Lesky. Greg already knew Jaden wasn't at his house. The officer asked Greg where he'd been, and the reply was, nowhere. Greg didn't get out of the car, and his demeanour was cautious. Police reports later said that he was acting a bit weird, but he was known to the cops as a weirdo, and they thought nothing of it. At around 5 in the morning, Greg woke up Belinda, who had fallen asleep in front of the heater. Greg then finally admitted to her that he'd been lying to her for hours. He acknowledged that Jaden was not a patient at the hospital. In fact, Greg had no idea where he was. He told Belinda to contact the police because the boy had probably been kidnapped. Belinda could tell that Greg was being serious this time, unlike the other occasions when his peculiar sense of humour was displayed. He gave Belinda a big hug and apologised for lying to her several times over the previous few hours. When asked why he'd lied, he told Belinda that he didn't want her to worry. According to Greg, he'd left Jaden at home on his couch when he went to go pick up Belinda from the pub earlier that evening. When they returned to his house and saw the broken windows a short time later, he presumed that Jaden had been kidnapped, but for some reason didn't think to immediately report the incident or even warn Belinda. The two quickly made their way to the closest police station where they reported Jaden missing. Greg told the police officer, Her baby's been kidnapped, my windows have been smashed, and they've left a pig's head there. During their initial conversation with police, Belinda struggled to keep herself composed, recounting her side of the story through drunken tears. She was still a little pissed and drowsy. The officer filing the police report decided to separate Greg and Belinda into different rooms for official interviews, because their stories were not lining up. Over the course of the following eight or so hours, it became apparent that Greg's account of the events didn't quite add up to a convincing narrative. Front door is still secure, you go, yeah. Okay, you walk in. And like, there was a in there, and... The panic, I just believe, still, like, you know, he's only a party, but he you know, got scared and... Did you tell Belinda? This is your opportunity now to tell us what happened. Nothing, that's it. Nothing happened. Yeah, I don't know, yeah, but you're the person who's blamed it up. You haven't been drinking, yeah. you haven't been using drugs. You haven't been taking medication. Yeah, Why can't you remember? This, we're talking six days ago. It's probably one of those the biggest events that's happened in your life, the disappearance of this child. That's what I mean, you know, you've got to run under pressure too. He vacillated between conflicting tales of what had happened and the police found him to be so suspect that they decided to arrest him and search his house and car for any indications of Jaden. In the end, they failed to uncover any evidence that would be incriminating, and Greg had to be released from detention a short while later. They organised surveillance on Greg, and police continued to monitor him for the next few weeks, hoping that he might slip up and potentially lead him to the now-missing Jaden Lesky, who was nowhere to be found. Yvonne Penfold's antagonism towards Greg Damasovich is explained by defining their initial relationship, in a word, dysfunctional. They'd lived together for what she described as two tumultuous, occasionally violent years after meeting in a nightclub. When they broke up, they continued to sleep together, but both took out intervention orders on each other, and they often played vengeful pranks on each other, culminating in the throwing of the pig's head on the night of Jaden's disappearance. Previously, Greg had vandalised Yvonne's car by drawing a witchcraft symbol on the bonnet, and on another occasion, used his own green falcon to push it up the driveway. And not to be outdone, Yvonne, in a precursor to the pig's head incident, had slaughtered Greg's pet pig Stinky and returned him as cuts of pork chops and bacon. What is with these people? Yvonne's older brother Kenny had recently got out of jail and decided to teach Greg a lesson. He got a severed pig's head, some rocks from the railway lines, and he and some mates sat and waited for Greg to go out. This was the same night of Jaden's disappearance. Kenny even had a shit on the railway tracks he'd been waiting for so long. Greg came out at one point and the guys got ready, but he just put a plastic bag in the bin and then went back inside. He then finally came out and left to go pick up Belinda from Turalgan. Kenny and his mates saw their chance and hurled rocks at his house and threw the pig's head at the window. It bounced and fell on the front lawn. They would later describe it as an idiotic act of revenge, but it only muddled up an already confusing crime scene. 
Following the filing of Jaden's missing persons report, Belinda was free to go, and she began making efforts to track down her missing child alongside her family and friends, who refused to leave her side. Following his release, Greg headed straight over to Belinda's house. Belinda later said that she wanted to kill him. She didn't know if he was lying or not. She wanted to shoot him in the foot, and if he didn't tell her what happened, she'd shoot him in the other foot. And she never did any of this, and surprisingly, she took Greg's side. In fact, over the next few months, she flip-flopped between being on Greg's side and thinking that he'd killed Jaden. In the process of performing the pig's head incident, the group of drunken louts that had vandalised Greg's home inadvertently made themselves witnesses to the potential crime. They'd testify over the next several weeks and pin down certain elements of the story, such as the time that Greg had left his house, somewhere between midnight and 1am, and providing an explanation for the broken window and the pig's head. They denied having any involvement in Jaden Lesky's disappearance. In what was considered their first mistake of many during the investigation, the police team did not examine inside Greg's house for fingerprints, even though two windows had been smashed in the pig's head attack. Greg claimed they focused on him because of complaints of harassment that he'd made previously about local police, which went as far as the police ombudsman. However, forensic police did perform an examination of Greg's house. They noted that all the front windows were smashed, there was a pig's head in the garden bed at the front of the house, which appeared that the pig's head had been thrown at the house twice, uh, striking a window on the third occasion. Every window had a piece of wood to prevent it being opened, and there was no sign of forced entry. Forensic examiner Trevor Evans also stated that there was no damage to the fallen glass inside the house, which would show an individual had stood on it. There was no physical evidence to suggest that anyone had entered the house via the windows. He also noted there were rocks in the lounge room of a similar size, shape and colour to rocks along the nearby railway line. Mr Evans said that there was a small particle of what appeared to be skin tissue on the centre of the upright grill and a number of hair fibres on the grill of the gas space heater. There were also blood spots on the bathroom wall. These, however, were later established to be Yvonne Penfold's blood. There were also a number of bloodstained tissues located in a plastic bag at the base of a wheelie bin at the front of the house. These were found to be Jaden's. Mr Evans also discovered $600 in cash, consisting of one $100 note and the balance in $50 notes, under a mattress in the bedroom. The notes were scrunched up and were wet, and when unbundled, they appeared to have been wet prior to being placed under the mattress. Mr. Evans considered that the level of wetness was consistent with being in a person's pocket while that person was immersed in water, but not while they were merely out in the rain. Greg said that it was his money, but he couldn't explain why it was wet. Mr. Evans examined Greg's car, which was a green Falcon XC sedan. He discovered a wet jacket on the floor of the rear of the vehicle and a very wet wallet on the floor underneath the acceleration pedal. He noted that the carpet on the floor of the vehicle was wet. He considered that this level of wetness was not consistent with the level of wetness of the wallet, which he thought looked as if it had been immersed in water. Some of the business cards in there, the ink had sort of gone off like it does when you get in the water. Belinda went away to New South Wales for two to three weeks in July, and during her time in New South Wales, she left keys to her house with Darren Farr and Sergeant Michael Roberts. When she came back, she found the dummy that Jaden had pinned to him on the day of his disappearance on the wall unit in her lounge room, and also a toy mobile phone that he had with him that day. There were clothes missing from Jaden's cupboard, including jumpsuits, jumpers, and jeans. When she returned from New South Wales, Belinda visited Greg's house, where she saw Jaden's windsheeter on the pillow on Greg's bed. She noted that the windsheeter was ripped around the throat and smelled of vomit. After a month of digging, the investigative team was convinced of Damasovitz's guilt. By July, officials had declared this a murder investigation, with them no longer believing that Jaden was alive. Their case against Greg was entirely circumstantial, with not one piece of conclusive evidence, and no body. Greg, for his part, continued to point the finger at other potential suspects. He made sure to point suspicion in the direction of his ex-girlfriend, Yvonne Penfold. However, on the 16th of July, 1997, despite critics claiming police had failed to fully investigate other suspects, police arrested Greg Demasovitz and charged him with Jaden's murder. Greg spent the next year or so behind bars, awaiting trial, while his lawyer Colin Lovett prepared his defence. In the meantime, though, the search for Jaden Lesky continued. Roughly six months after Jaden went missing, 
On New Year's Day 1998, a family was celebrating the summer weather with a picnic at Blue Rock Dam. The young son of the family saw something floating in the water. He showed his grandparents and contacted the police. Senior Constable Brian Hall subsequently retrieved the body from the dam at about 6.05pm. At about 7.45pm, Dr Shelley Robertson, a forensic pathologist at the Victorian Institute of Forensic Medicine, attended the dam. She noted that the body was clad in dark green tracksuit pants, a dark green tracksuit top, a long sleeve blue top bearing the words mishmash, a disposable nappy, and white socks with a blue motif. The body was identified as that of Jaden Lesky. His body was transported to the Victorian Institute of Forensic Medicine in Southbank for autopsy. According to the police reports filed at the time, Jaden was found in some of the same clothing from when he disappeared, and his body had been weighed down in the water with a crowbar. He had an elastic type bandage on his left arm, which covered his skin from elbow to wrist. An autopsy would later reveal that the boy's arm had been broken no more than a day or two prior to his death, due to there being no signs of healing. The bandage appeared to have been haphazardly placed on Jaden's arm, and it was theorised that he might have been applied after his death, due to the severe pain that it would have caused the child. Just a few metres away from Jaden's body, police found the bag that his mother had prepared for him, full of snacks, toys, etc., and a waterlogged child's sleeping bag. Curiously, the sleeping bag seemed to have belonged to Belinda's sister Katie, who had a similar looking sleeping bag that Belinda had borrowed months prior. Despite the sleeping bag being unaccounted for, it had somehow ended up at the location of Jaden's body near the Blue Rock Dam. Because Jaden's body was so well preserved at the time of his discovery, it was speculated that he'd been thrown into the water during the winter months and the cold water had kept his remains mostly intact. However, partial decomposition had started to take place and officials were unable to confirm the wound to the back of Jaden's head as his official cause of death. For that reason, they were unable to rule out other potential causes, such as strangulation or drowning. The most surprising thing to come out of the autopsy was the finding of a drug called Ben's Hexol in Jaden's blood, which is usually found in medication for Parkinson's disease. Jaden had been drugged with this substance several hours before his death, but it was impossible to establish a firm timetable for its consumption. It is possible that he accidentally had ingested Ben's Hexol, being a child and all, but the side effects of the drug range from minute to severe, everything from dizziness and nausea to hallucinations. Police continued with their investigations, with the finger of the law pointing at one suspect, who they had charged with murder, Greg Demasovich. The trial of Greg Demasovich would become a media circus throughout Victoria, dominating many of the headlines that year. It took place over 34 days in November and December of 1998, and rolled along like an episode of Neighbours or Home and Away. The public was given all of the details about Greg and Belinda's relationship, the affair that Greg had carried on with his ex-girlfriend Yvonne, uh, the pig's head gang that was responsible for vandalising Greg's home. It was a public airing of dirty laundry. The defence argued that evidence pointed to Jaden living for weeks, if not months, after he'd gone missing in June 1997. Their evidence was the length of Jaden's hair uh, appeared to be longer than it had been when he went missing, but this could have been due to the skin around his hair follicles receding and his hair simply appearing longer than it had been. Dental records suggested that Jaden died at around 14 months old, which was his age at the time he went missing. The prosecution pointed towards Greg Demasovich's history of abusive behaviour, directed towards not only his ex-girlfriend Yvonne, but even Belinda Murphy and Jaden himself. On multiple occasions, Greg was noted by friends and family as having locked Jaden outside with his dogs and ignoring him when he cried, and on the rare occasion that he was left alone with him, Jaden would come back to his mother's house with unexplained bumps and bruises. Belinda had overlooked these incidents at the time, but they appeared incredibly troubling in retrospect. The prosecution posited that in the early days of the case, they discovered evidence that seemed suspicious. This included some of Greg's clothing at the time of his arrest, as well as his wallet, both of which were soaking wet and seemed to implicate him having deposited Jaden's remains in a body of water. A search of his home revealed wet banknotes and bloody tissues found in Greg's garbage can seemed to match up with Jaden's blood type. However, despite these pieces of evidence pointing towards suspicion, they weren't really incriminating in any way. The media couldn't get enough of it. They breathlessly reported all of the stories of the trial and held interview after interview with the colourful people that were involved with the story. The state assembled a solid case against Greg Demasovic, but in the end, they were unable to secure a conviction for the murder of Jaden Lesky.
After thorough deliberation, the jury found Greg not guilty on the 4th of December 1998, and he was released. Greg's guilt could not have been proven beyond a reasonable doubt by the prosecution. Despite Greg's acquittal in the murder trial of Jaden Lesky, he was far from innocent in the public's eyes. Many still blamed him for the toddler's death, either directly or indirectly. It would turn out that Greg had supposedly confessed to another prisoner while he was being held. Greg allegedly confessed to the prisoner that Jaden had died accidentally and that something had happened to cause the jacked up car to fall on Jaden while Greg was out working on it. This would have explained Jaden's broken arm and possibly the medications that were later discovered in his circulation, which may have been used in an effort to temporarily lessen Jaden's discomfort or render him unconscious. The testimony of this prisoner, however, was eventually ruled to be inadmissible and it was not admitted to during the trial. It's possible that the prisoner was just trying to get a little bit less time on his sentence. In 2004, an inquest was officially announced by Coroner Graham Johnston, who released his findings in 2006. The findings were as follows. Jaden Lesky was a defenceless 14-month-old toddler who was entirely dependent on his adult carers for care, support and food at the time of his death. He could say three or four words and had only recently learned to walk. In the end, his parents, Brett and Belinda, who were at the time separated, were in charge of his care and safety. However, due to their separation, his mother, Belinda, was in charge of his daily care and security. On the two days in question, Belinda temporarily turned over her responsibilities to a friend, Greg Demasovich, while she visited her sister in the afternoon, attended a party, and then spent a significant amount of time drinking in a Turalgan hotel during the evening and the following morning. As a result, Mr. Damasovis took on the role of babysitter and was temporarily in charge of taking care of Jaden. Jaden passed away while he was in the care of Mr. Damasovis. Injury to the head is most likely the cause of death, whether the events leading to his death occurred by accident, through omission, or some other way. The precise manner of his death is still a subject of debate and discussion. Other than the fact that it happened just before he passed away, it's still unclear exactly how he sustained the arm injuries. However, Greg Demasovich ultimately failed to provide the necessary and adequate level of protective supervision, care and support to look after the infant. He was a helpless person who required total support, care and protection by an adult. Otherwise, he would not have sustained the injuries from which he died. Whatever occurred that caused Jaden's injuries happened while he was under Greg's temporary supervision, hence he has contributed to the death. Greg has not offered a convincing other explanation for the events and dumped Jaden's body in the neighbouring Blue Rock Dam after his passing. He obviously had the time and opportunity to do so. The evidence supporting this satisfactory conclusion is as follows. A. Greg Demasovich is the last person to have seen Jaden Lesky alive. B. Following the incident or incidents that ultimately led to Jaden's death, Greg had time to dispose of the body in the dam, either before picking up Belinda from the hotel, or in the early hours of the morning of the 15th of June, or after leaving her at her house and before they both went to the police to report the little boy missing. C. Before and after picking Belinda up from the hotel, Greg misled her about Jaden's whereabouts and health. D. Belinda was not shown Jaden when she arrived at Greg's house from the hotel when Greg claimed that he realised the child was missing. And E. Greg's wallet and money were wet, consistent with having entered <coughs> consistent with having entered the water in order to dispose of the body. It is not possible to draw any conclusions about the particular manner of Jaden Lesky's death, whether it was an accident or not, despite the fact that it has been decided that Greg Demasovich disposed of the child's body. The Jaden Lesky case appeared to receive a lot of attention again in the 2006 inquest, which was harshly critical of Greg Demasovich and Victoria Police, particularly the Forensic Science Unit, whose improper handling of the evidence made a re-examination years later nearly impossible. Greg Demasovich is the only person who has ever been charged or even publicly suspected of Jaden's murder. Many continue to call for justice, including Jaden's mother Belinda, in the 25 plus years since Jaden's death, she is married and had multiple children. Belinda Williams continues to plead with Greg Demasovich to reveal all that he knows about Jaden's case. In April 2014, on what would have been Jaden's 18th birthday, Belinda published an open letter in the Herald Sun. Soon it should be Jaden's 18th birthday. I've been thinking about it for weeks. 
What would I do on the day he was born, 18 years later, without him here? What would I do on this day to remember my son and do something in his memory? What I wouldn't give to have him here in the morning when he wakes up, spoil him with presents and be able to wish him a happy 18th birthday. Instead, it will be a day of no presents and no presents. Instead, I write this letter to you, Greg Demasovitz. I've already pressed delete a million times while typing this, because really, what do I say to you? There isn't a day that passes in my life that I don't say good morning or good night to Jaden. I don't always say it out loud and mostly keep my thoughts in my own head. What I can't understand is how you can look into that mirror each day and know what you did to my whole entire family. At first, when all this happened, it was all a bit of a blur. I never imagined in my wildest dreams that I would ever wake up to the nightmare that this has been, and probably will be until my last breath. I am now 38 years old. I still wake up every day and go to bed every night. I cry in silence. I think in silence. I'm somewhat trapped in my own mind because I don't want to burden anyone with what I feel or what I go through each and every single day. I have lost friends and my entire family because of the bitter and untrusting person I have become. I take my children to school and every single day a part of me is scared that they won't be there when I go to pick them up. I rarely let them stay over at friends' houses in case something happens and in a way I spoil them so they have everything they need at home and won't want to go to friends' houses. I'll be making my children's school lunches in the morning and a part of me feels guilty that when I am buttering that bread, I'm not making his lunch for him. I can be brushing my hair and wonder what his hair would be like, what he would look like, what he would smell like. I'll be in the laundry folding the washing and wondering what he would be wearing today. Where's his pile of clothes? I pretend he's sitting on the end of my bed in the middle of the night and I stare at the end of the bed hoping that this could all just be a nightmare from which I will someday wake up from. When Daniel Morecambe's killer was sentenced recently, a part of me was happy to see that pig rot in jail for the rest of his life. Yet a part of me was a little jealous that Jaden's case is still a mystery. You will never, ever even come close to what a mother goes through when her child is taken from her. When Jaden was missing, I kept telling myself that he would turn 18 someday and find me. I honestly believed that. But he will be turning 18 soon, and I know there will be no knock on the door. When Michael Roberts came up the top of the hill at the Blue Rock Dam the day he was found and sat me in his car and explained to me that it was Jaden's body that was found, I can't even begin to explain what hearing those words were like to a parent. When I lost Jaden, I lost myself. I have no real friends. I have no family left. I push people away because I find it extremely hard to trust anyone now near my children. As soon as people get close to me, I start panicking and find reasons to eliminate them from my life rather than them hurt me or my children. I was asked recently how I would celebrate Jaden's birthday. Celebrate is used for happy times, happy memories, and I won't celebrate Jaden's birthday because I can't. Please, before you die, write down what happened and store it somewhere. But please, if anything, for Jaden, let the truth be known to all. I know nothing that ever happens in the future, nothing will ever bring him back to me, but we deserve to know what happened. So please, before your own life ends, please just tell the truth. Jaden deserves that much. Thanks for your time today. I really appreciate you watching the whole video. Join me next time as we trawl through another episode in the true crime history of Australia. If you've enjoyed this video, once again, please go ahead and shoot the like button with your trusty boomstick, stab that subscribe button until it bleeds, and make sure that you punch the notification bell in the face so that you can get notified every time we release a new video. Remember, all of our episodes are released at the same time on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts from. I'm also on Instagram, at something about murder, and I respond to every message I receive. So I look forward to hearing from you, and I hope you don't get murdered. Stay safe out there. Bye. Come on, Greg, tell us what you did. <laughs>